Curious Case Manager. I'm Vicky Gilman and I am the Curious Case Manager. And today I have with me Celia Kitzinger. And Celia is Honorary Professor at Cardiff University. And Celia, I'm going to ask you um, to talk with us about the Open Justice Project. Before I do that, would you like to extend on that uh, introduction a little with your other roles and, and uh, let us hear those? Sure. Um, I'm actually based in the law school at Cardiff University, but my background is in psychology um, and I've got an academic career behind me in social psychology. Um, at Cardiff, I'm co-director of the Coma and Disorders of Consciousness Research Centre, which has been going for about 10 years, jointly with my sister Jenny Kitzinger. The um, Open Justice Court of Protection Project, which started on the 15th of June this year, um, is co-directed with Jill Looms Quinn, and I, that's what you asked me to talk about today. Absolutely, and I thought it was important though to understand the context of, of all the other roles that you have, um, and perhaps a little bit about how you arrived at this. So how did the, the Open Justice Project um, come into being? So the Open Justice Court of Protection Project is designed to get more members of the public observing court of protection hearings. Uh, it came into being because Jenny Kitzinger and I had observed a lot of hearings concerning serious medical treatment in the Court of Protection. Those have been open to the public forever. Um, and we'd done that in our roles um, with the Coma and Disorders of Consciousness Research Centre. So we often accompanied families who were um, involved in court hearings about continuing or withdrawing clinically assisted nutrition and hydration into the courtroom and supported them through the court process. Um, and I was involved in the first ever all remote hearing in the Court of Protection um, back in March this year. I think it was the day after the Prime Minister had introduced social distancing. So it was entirely accidental. I was actually on my way to Nottingham for the court hearing when um, the the solicitor for the family member phoned up and said don't come we, we've got we've got to go socially distanced she was actually flying in from another european country and was on her way and we'd arranged to meet that evening stay in a hotel together and then go to the hearing the next day so we both continued our journeys and we ended up having this first ever remote hearing in as it turned out, empty court, em empty um, solicitors' buildings in the centre of Nottingham um, with the barrister and the solicitor for her. And it was the first ever all remote hearing. It was a horrendous experience. It was absolutely devastating. Um, it was completely lacking in empathy and understanding for what she, the daughter of the man whose feeding tube may or may not be withdrawn was going through. Um, she was there throughout and was completely ignored, um, except for when she was giving her evidence. Um, and there was a lot of rather um, unpleasant crowing about the technology, which rather overtook a focus on P, the person at the center of the case, her father. A lot of talk about, oh, look, can we do this? Can we get documents on screen? Can we play a video? Aren't we doing well? Hey, we're the first ever to be doing this. And, and they published about it afterwards in very much those terms. We were involved in the first ever all remote court of protection hearing. Look how well we did. Here's how you do it. There were indeed, here's how you do it. So I felt compelled to talk with the daughter. I called her Sarah. Um, about her experience and to write up what it was like for us um, as lay participants in that court hearing and to describe how 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 horrendous it was um, and i i i wrote quite a, a widely publicized and well-known blog piece for the transparency project uh, about that hearing which i think was then taken as meaning i was against remote hearings full stop and I wasn't so sure that remote hearings couldn't be done better, particularly once the technology settled down, but maybe also with a different judge. There are very different judicial styles. And maybe with someone who was more inclined to put P at the center of decisions about them and someone who was more willing to be open to listening to and sensitive to P's family. 
So about a month later, well, in May, I, I decided to start observing remote hearings to see if they could be done better. And they can be done much better. And am I right in thinking you challenged yourself to listen to, was it one a day through the month? Yeah. Yeah, it was the equivalent of one a day during May, uh, one working day. It had turned out to have two bank holidays. <laughs> so I miscalculated as well, but it did mean 19 during May, and I made that target only just. And it was the process of trying to observe that many remote hearings. I very quickly answered my own question, can remote hearings be done with empathy? Can they be done sensitively? Can they be justice as opposed to miscarriage of justice? And my answer is yes. But in the process, I revealed a whole lot of other problems with trying to access hearings and indeed with open justice in the Court of Protection. Um, they're very hard to get access to. Um, it's very hard to know when, the, when and where the court hearings are happening. The listings are a mess. Um, it's very many are vacated or adjourned. So you can ask to join a hearing and then it just, it just goes, which is nobody's fault. But you know, it, it does make it difficult. You kind of need backup hearings ready to go when the one you want to go to is adjourned. Um, they were giving f f incorrect information, um, missing information, no contact details. Um, I was incorrectly told that they were pri being held in private, that I was told several times by court staff that all court protection hearings were being held in private during the coronavirus emergency which is not true, but it meant I didn't get access. Um, a couple of judges, I'm afraid, also told me this. Um, there was a lack of preparedness on the part of court staff and the judiciary to have a public observer present. Despite the fact that these are open to those observers. Well, it was slightly- but They never have been, uh, were they always open to observers? Ah, uh, no. Um, and when the court was, okay, so, so that, this is slightly complicated. I'll say it and then you can edit as needed. But um, when the Court of Protection was um, founded in its current form with the Mental Capacity Act, um, 2005, they were private hearings, all of them. And the press didn't, in fact, gain access until 2009. So that's where the origins of this phrase, the secret court, come from. And members of the public didn't have access in 2009. It was only the press. Um, members of the public didn't, um, didn't get, really get access until 2016 with the transparency pilot. And that has now been formalized into the court protection procedure in 2017. So they are now public with reporting restrictions, by and large. It is possible still to hold them in private, but most of them now are public with reporting restrictions. And that has come about as a result of the commitment to transparency of the judiciary, most particularly um, Mr. Justice Hayden as the Vice President of the Court of Protection, who is very clear that, I quote, transparency is central to the culture of the Court of Protection. Um, but from 2016, 2017 onwards, there was very low attendance. It would be very rare to find a member of the public there, and the judiciary weren't used to it. Now, when the um, public health crisis hit, the transparency pilot was predicated on the idea that these hearings were in courtrooms and that members of the public would walk through doors and sit on actual seats in physical public galleries. And of course, this wasn't going to be possible. So the transparency pilot was suspended and all of the transparency orders that permit members of the public to attend and tell them what the reporting restrictions are, were immediately, um, I'm not sure what the right word is, retracted, annulled, whatever. They were no longer applicable. And so the word private started to be seen against an awful lot of court of protection hearings in the listings. Private didn't turn out to mean that you couldn't go there, and I had to work this out. Um, what private meant was the, trans the, the transparency order that used to be in place and is normally in place is no longer there, but if you want to go, you just need to ask and give a reason and we'll let you in. And I was only, in lots and lots of requests, I was only denied access to one private hearing ever. 
They're denied access to one. Um, what about the, the number that you couldn't get into for other reasons? And I, I'm, I've been quite aware of that watching on Twitter. When you were doing uh, the number you were trying to achieve in May, I could see that on various days there would be tweets saying, you know, I'm waiting. Has anyone got the correct details? Does anyone know who to contact? And I've seen other people since having, having some of those problems too. So how, how many did you not find you could access for, for those sorts of reasons, roughly? So about one in three are vacated or adjourned. So that's nobody's fault. That's inevitable. That's part of court life. So that gets rid of about a third. Of the others, I would say about half during May, about half I would not be able to get access to. People wouldn't respond to emails. Um, I would be falsely told that they were private. Um, I would... Um, I would not have an email to write to um, and no, there, was no, there, there still is very little information about if you want access, who do you contact? Um, so all of, or, or somebody would say, I will have to ask the judge and then they would not get access to the judge in time because the judge was in a previous hearing and went straight from one hearing to another. So for lots of reasons in May, about half of the hearings that actually happened, I didn't get access to. Now that's improved massively since then. And do you think it's improved because of, of the project? Oh, yes. So when we started the project, it was um, myself and Jill Looms Quinn started the project very much in response to the problems of access that I had had with remote hearings during May, and which you saw documented on Twitter, and that Jill had had in the hearings that she'd observed actually in the courtroom back in 2017 as one of the first researchers to have done um, in-person research in the Court of Protection using the Transparency Project. So we've talked about my problems of access in accessing remote justice. Jill's problems were in some ways similar in that it was hard to get hold of the lists, things would be cancelled without notice, um, she could be left waiting outside a courtroom and nobody would take her in. She could be told wrongly that it was in private and a note would be put on the door saying private when it wasn't private. She also had additional problems as a disabled activist researcher. So she was, um, there were difficulties for her with accessing, physically accessing the courtroom. At that time she was using sticks to walk with um, being able to have physically a desk on which to write while she was observing in order to make her observations because those are reserved for the lawyers um, and are at the front and she would get one of the public benches at the back which would mean she didn't have anything to press on to write with being required to stand up and sit down again repeatedly when judges turn up and stuff so barriers to access can be both physical barriers in the physical court and virtual barriers uh, and informational barriers um, both in the physical court and in the virtual court um, and those are barriers that the, that we have been addressing in open justice court protection and that we know um, the court protection itself is concerned about it's particularly ironic that people with disabilities should have difficulty accessing a court which specializes in people with disabilities. Yeah, just thinking how ironic that, that is, both, both physically and, and in other ways. I mean, all of those challenges have been very great for, for you and for Jill, um, and I know now for other people sometimes. So if that's difficult, how much more difficult for P at times as well? Indeed. Yeah. Yes. So we've and so, so there's a sense of um, the project um, helping to show the transparency but also actually helping to move things forward at, at yes probably a more rapid rate than often happens within the legal circles i would think well we haven't waited around for funding we're doing it entirely for free and putting other jobs aside in order to be able to focus on it we're both passionately committed to this open justice is something we care about a lot um, we've both got the experience of observing in the Court of Protection and we have found it invaluable in our own lives, both as activists for disability rights um, and as um, academics who want to better understand um, how the court works and indeed become more legally literate about the processes by which decisions are made. So what the practical things the project does is it shares the court lists because they're, they're, at the moment, 
you can't, there is no one single list of all of the hearings in the Court of Protection. They're scattered over three different websites. So we bring them together and we put them in one place where people can access them. We've got a wiki which provides, it's a, called a public observer wiki, which is a one-stop page which has information and support for people who want to actually observe. And of course, we will also provide individual support to people when they need it or want it. We publish um, our own blogs uh, on our observations about hearings that we've seen. And we also include links to publish judgments when they come out in association with those hearings. Most of the hearings we're watching, they don't ever have a published judgment, um, which again makes it really important to, that somebody bore witness to what happens. We do updates on developments and we um, are also very aware that the feedback that we're providing about our experience as relatively savvy um, researchers in the Court of Protection, if we're having difficulty getting access, so, you know, what hope anybody else? And we're aware that that's being fed back to the Court of Protection, to Hive, which is headed up by Mr. Justice Hayden and is um, coordinating the activities of the Court of Protection during the public health crisis. And we're aware, for example, that they have made huge efforts to support the project and to support open justice more generally. Specifically, here it, uh, the um, listings have improved. They're not there yet, but they've improved massively in terms, for example, of providing contact details. That, that might sound a small thing, but it's really basic if you want access. Many, many more now provide contact details. Many more now also provide some basic information about what you might be going to see, because before, literally all you got would be 10 o'clock, before Justice Keenan, uh, number 135792. Well, that doesn't tell you much. Now, increasingly, we're seeing things like um, where P should live and uh, what care P should receive, or some, some tag of some kind that gives you a sense of what it is that you might choose that hearing to observe because those might be your interests. And another way in which things have really improved, and again, this is down to Mr. Justice Hayden, has been that he wrote a letter very early on in this process saying, please judges ensure that the applicant, so the, the counsel for the applicant in court provides a summary of the issues to be addressed. So that if they're not in the listings, you're not thrown in at the deep end with barristers arguing with each other about something without any sense of who P is, what their impairment is, what they have capacity to decide and not to decide, and what the court is now charged with trying to figure out. So now in about half of cases, and I'm afraid it still is only half because the message hasn't quite got through yet, you will get either the judge or the counsel for the applicant um, saying, okay, this case is about um, Mr. Blanc, she's he's in a he's in a care home he has been diagnosed with dementia and he wants to go home and he has been determined not to have capacity to decide his place of residence um, at a previous hearing and this hearing is to determine what is in his best interests given his strong views and we have here the official solicitor who will be representing P and we have and, and so on. So then you get a kind of sense of what, what is going to happen before it starts. And this takes, you know, three or four minutes of the court's time. But its benefits for us as observers are huge because actually now we can follow the hearings. And the distinct all you need is the, is the synopsis of you, you're making me think it must otherwise be almost like switching a film on halfway through where you've no idea what the plot is and you have to grapple yeah. to try and gather the threads and figure it out whereas for the want of a short synopsis um you can yes. then perform that that task and, and write it up afterwards in a much more informed way um yeah what was I going to ask you then I, I was just wondering um sort of what what we've learned or, or what you feel you've you've learned from them, from from the content of them. I appreciate they're about all sorts of different issues, but mm -hmm. I was wondering whether whether there are any major themes that have struck you. I'm someone who's watched a lot of serious medical treatment hearings before, 
um, I had not fully appreciated the wide range and scope of issues that get decided in the Court of Protection. I mean, I had known in theory that, of course, they decide where P should live, who P should have contact with, um, what or, or the, mon the, the I say mundane, but I don't really, they're mundane comparison in comparison with life and death decisions. But they're, of course, hugely impactful on the daily, everyday life of P. And it seems that the Court of Protection invades or controls or has influence over every moment of somebody's life if they're detained in a place they don't want to be if they're not allowed contact with their family um, if if they're required to take certain medication they don't want to take um, if as in one hearing um, covert medication is authorized if restraint is is authorized so i've become very aware of the fact that once you once you or I lose capacity, people are going to be making these decisions about our everyday lives, and they may be making them in ways that we don't like. So one of the most important things that I personally have got out of it is I'm adding to my, I already have an advanced decision to refuse treatment. I already have an advanced statement, um, and I already have a lasting power of attorney which I hope mean that the, the scope of the court will be very limited as regards me because I've given somebody else the right to make best interest decisions about me. And I've made a lot of decisions about me that won't be best interest because they're mine and I've done them now. But I can still envisage a scenario in which I would end up before the court of protection. And I've added to my advance statement a page about how I would like the court of protection to behave towards me, please and what it would like to take into account and what weight it would like to give to the different areas of my life and different aspects of my choices. And for me, that has been quite liberating because it has dealt with a fear that I have, um, autonomy being very important to me, and the idea of other people making decisions for me being quite repellent. So um, I've tried to, as much as possible, influence that and affect that. I think a lot of the bad press from the Court of Protection other than it's a secret court, has been because people can see the power that it exerts without being able to see the processes by which it treats its own power, I think very responsibly, I now think, um, and with a great deal of care and attention to P, to P's values, to P's wishes. And I've been impressed by, and I think the blog shows of all the observers have been impressed by the care and attention given to the individual at the center of the case and a focus from the judge sometimes much more than from the health and social care professionals a focus from the judge on peace wishes peace values peace feelings peace beliefs i think that surprised people i think that's pleased people I think that's reassured observers. And for health and social care professionals, crucially, it's provided them with a template, a model of how they in their own lives can behave towards decision making in relation to P. And that's really important. So there's a, there's a sense there then that there are practical problems with accessing it and they are improving um, and, and they've obviously taken up quite a lot of your time and there's still the idea that you, if you want to listen you've got to put aside some time and then you may need to have some backups if you want to spend let's say your day uh, listening to this um, but when you get past that and you're actually listening I'm, I'm very much picking up a sense of a, a good overall a, a good process a good you know that we are doing this quite well um it's not secrets it's tricky to access becoming easier but it's a good thing that we have it is more in line with p's values and wishes than than perhaps people might expect when they think of courts making decisions for other yeah. people I, th I think um i've picked up the idea from some of the observers that i've talked to that they have they have a sense of the law as as black letter law as as a set of rules that kind of just then get applied to living breathing individuals 
irrespective of them because justice is blind why would you look at the individual and and, and there's a there's a a, a surprise i can only describe it as a surprise um and and if you read the blogs you pick up on that mm. at the extent to which each case is as hayden always says fact specific so there's a lot of inquiry into what P did before, what P might want for the future, um, different perspectives on P and choices that P has made or might make, um, and the extent to which decisions are tailored to the individual. We think things wind up at the Court of Protection when, when the idea of black and white law is what people have been grappling with in the real world with whichever are both sides of that case well that's my other surprise. It needs to arrive in the court of protection to to move away no. from that right no no that's not been my experience unfortunately my other surprise about the court of protection has been how many of the cases are case management and long-running case management that there will have often been you mentioned about listening in to a hearing without a introduction as watching a film that's part way through but in fact even with the introduction it's a film that's part way through you're on you know as number five of the sequel of the sequel and there's another 18 episodes or something so so many hearings go back years they will have um they will have been heard last year or the year before or even the year before that this will be a long running series of hearings at which Basically, as far as I can see, there is a problem with the way that local authorities, clinical commissioning groups, trusts, health and social services are liaising, working together, sharing information, collaborating, and the judge is doing case management. And it seems a very expensive and very um, cumbersome way of managing a case to do it in the court like this the, the fact that advocates meetings the reason why so many of the hearings are adjourned or or um vacated is because advocates meetings are happening literally the hour before where finally people who should have been talking to each other for the last few months since the case was listed or ideally before the case was listed finally get their act together phone somebody up and get their reports exchange the email that they should have exchanged weeks before but they were waiting for a response and they didn't get round to it um and resolve their differences so cases are getting on the brink of court for that to occur which doesn't that seems, that. exactly that seems to be it. and i do appreciate everybody's terribly busy and especially at the moment with coronavirus but often these cases go way back before that so it does seem to be that health and social services and the NHS are, is on its knees, that people are commissioning reports that don't happen, or somehow um, they're not managing to get multidisciplinary team meetings organized, or, um, or people just hope the problem will go away. I've certainly heard a few cases where, where there has been clear disagreement between say family and care home staff and about treatment and, and a GP. And it's just like, well, the family are wrong. You know, if we just ignore it, they'll just go away and of course maybe it does go away in some cases but in these cases it hasn't gone away and so this whole process of, of implementing this through the courts I mean I do think the courts do a great job under difficult circumstances but so many of these cases I feel why is this in court this doesn't require a judge this requires a case manager who can actually fix this um, and if there's disagreement the maybe about, mediation. and the point you make about how many actually get close to and then resolve the matter would suggest that it's resolvable therefore without court and yes. that's the frustrating thing well that and also the nature of the resolution so in so many court hearings what the judge does is hear the difference of opinion if there is one i mean often there isn't there isn't one but the, there may be the judge will say something like well why don't we get an expert report let's commission an expert report and then of course you're all back in court two months later to discuss the expert report 
or there will be, well, we, he doesn't like this placement, so we're looking for another placement, but we haven't found the other placement yet. There's, there's three possibilities, but we haven't been able to get in because of coronavirus, and this one isn't quite right for this reason, and this one isn't quite right for this reason, and this one hasn't replied to our email, so we don't know whether it will be right or not. So the judge says, okay, well, hurry up and get those reports, you know, um, <laughs> have a video conference with them and then be back in court two months later. And I'm hearing an awful lot of that where, where it's clearly one in a series of hearings and we're still waiting on a resolution. And I try to pick them up two months later, although often then the date gets changed and I'm, I miss them. Um, but I'm on to having only started on the 1st of May. I've already heard four, yeah, four hearings on one case. Um, each one moving it along a small increment and quite a few I've heard two hearings on the same case and a few more three hearings so I'm already picking up you know successive successive sequels in this on, unfolding drama and you get the sense that they're going to go on and on and on and I'm thinking why are we doing it this way? Couldn't we get a case manager? So, so do you think for health and social care professionals um, listening in and, and, and educating oneself in how it works and having that experience of how all the factors are weighed up and discussed and how the judge thinks about that, I wonder whether you think that might influence how people then pick their own way through that sort of process without needing to come to court, perhaps. It's not very educational in that sense, if more people so took the opportunity. The hearings are open to any member of the public, but and there, quite a lot of lawyers are attending, student lawyers um, and, and surprisingly people, lawyers from other parts of the legal system. But uh, the, I would say maybe two thirds of the people who are taking up the invitation to be observers are health and social care professionals, partly because some of them are anxious about needing to be in court themselves in the future or because they have got um, they have got clients whose cases will be before the courts, whether or not they're involved. So they're aware of the court pressing that happens in their clients' lives. But many of them are seeking to understand better how the Mental Capacity Act works, not in black letter law, um, and not, not via training that just keeps putting up sections of the Mental Capacity Act and reading them out to people, and then referring to case law, but actually unfolding in practice. And that's what you get to see when you observe a hearing. You get to see how the judges think about it and how how it unfolds moment by moment with real contingencies in place. Like, well, we can't do that because, or we tried that and it didn't work. So that this is not abstract. This is vivid, live, concrete. And so if you look at the professionals who've written blogs on our site, what they are reflecting on often is how this impacts upon their own understanding of what they're doing in their everyday lives. Um, as psychologists, as social workers, sometimes as case managers, we have an MCA trainer. Um, and the other, a very few people who've observed are family members of people who are going to go through the courts. And they're asking to observe court protection hearings in advance of being in court themselves, either as litigants in person in a couple of cases, um, or simply as an observer themselves for their family member. And they're wanting to prepare themselves for that, which is of course, an invaluable and really important opportunity. I should think so, and one more people probably need to know about, and, and hopefully this this video will help. So um, it, it does sound to me like something that, that I haven't done yet, but I certainly want to, and I would encourage um, other people that I work with to do the same. Um, so how can you get involved? How can you get involved with your project? How can you get to the point of writing the blog afterwards i'm assuming you would like more blogs well they're not compulsory but we're very interested in hearing what people make of the court hearings that they observe first stop is our website um so that's open justice court protection project and um you will find a public observer wiki which um, has all the information that you need in order to observe a hearing in the court of protection if there are a group of people say in an organization who would all like an hour's training, we will do that, one or other of us for free, um, via Zoom. 
So we've done that sort of short term collaborative project with Essex law students, for example. So a bunch of those took part in a wiki and are now busily observing hearings. We've also done it with a group of social workers. Uh, again, an hour's online seminar, which then equip them to go away and do it. It's helpful to observe with other people and to have other people to discuss the hearing with, um, particularly long hearings. Um, and sometimes we've set up with people um, chat rooms that we can discuss. I know you had closed chat rooms for the people who are listening to the detail. Yeah. That's, That's particularly so for, we did that for um, Mr. Justice Hayden's hearing of the, um, the so-called Palestinian hunger striker case, which went on for three and a half days. And we had a chat room in which I think there were eight of us discussed, what did, he, what did that mean? And when he said that, do you think? And I don't understand that. Well, that's outrageous. You know, just where we were able to speak to each other about it as it was unfolding and share experience across, across midwifery, law, psychology, um, you know, a range of different professional backgrounds. It was a fascinating discussion. I love the idea of a, a group of people coming together, um, not as a group initially, just because that is the, the point of interest and then becoming a group. Yes, that's yeah. A very natural but, way to form a group that's genuinely interested in that, that topic. So for that to be set up, people have to let me know that they're attending a hearing and then I can put people in touch and they mm -hmm. can form a group of which I may or may not be part. But I think... Um, the most important thing is to want to do it and to understand why it's important because six million people a year are impacted by the Mental Capacity Act and the court protection is one of the key places where the, 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 the grand scenario of the Mental Capacity Act gets, gets beaten out and gets, gets made into law and made into practice. Um, so wanting to do it, understanding that it will be useful and then set aside either a morning or an afternoon the night before go on the website find a hearing or two or three for backup um, send off the email that evening hope when you get up at 7 30 in the morning that you've got a response if you haven't keep looking um, hope that you get not maybe not your first choice but maybe your second choice or your third choice watch the hearing um, Prepare for it in advance by doing the, the wiki, because that way you'll get most out of it. You'll get a sense of what, you know, we've got things on what is the transparency order, so that you're not freaked out by that. What is a bundle and what is in it that people are likely to refer to? Who's who in the court of protection? So who are these people that you're going to be listening to? So for anyone who isn't familiar with the court already, there's some very basic helpful resources that if you read them in advance will enable you to listen with much more confidence that you understand what you're listening to. Um, and then set aside some time afterwards to not rush straight into your next meeting, but to spend some time reflecting on what you've observed or discussing it with a colleague. Or yes, please write us the blog. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a, a fantastic guide through. Um, you certainly encouraged me to, um, to pick up that opportunity and start talking more to everybody else about doing that. And um, I, I can only think that, that the, the opportunities to learn more, this has to help patients, clients, um, people who, who lack capacity, um, but where very difficult decisions have to be made. The more we can learn, the more we can hear other people. And the, that thought process of going through the decision making, I think to, to hear the judge going through that, is, is such a, an invaluable thing, actually. Yeah. And, and the we who are observing includes some peas. A couple of peas have contacted me wanting an observer in the court where their case is being discussed because they believe that justice is more likely to be done if somebody is watching. So some peas have contacted me saying, my, my case is going to be in court. Would you come and observe it? Mm -hmm. Families have requested the same, families of P, and to bear in mind that all of us are possible future P's. So it's not just about them, it's about us as well. About everyone, yeah. yeah. 
that's absolutely fascinating, Celia. Thank you so much for joining me um, to have this discussion. And I know that there are going to be many, many more people that are interested and hopefully that then avail themselves of the opportunity. Probably quite a few people who didn't know you could. So uh, thank you for taking it Al, and we'll post the details of the website as well, uh, the video, so that people can find it easily. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.